in 605 BC and 597 BC. The Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, made his entrance, his first entries into Judah, and he began to pillage in increasing measure. By 587 BC, Jerusalem and its temple had been burned to the ground. In the earliest stages, Nebuchadnezzar took the most promising people of Jerusalem as hostages. Strategically, this included many people still in their teens and in their early 20s. Ezekiel was a 25-year-old priest in training. And guys like the four we'll be reading about shortly are likely in their late teens and headed to administrative work in or around the palace. It, was, it wasn't going to be through oppression and military presence that Nebuchadnezzar would be holding his growing empire together. He didn't have the army to accomplish that. But he would instead assimilate the young into the ways of his kingdom. If they were treated well, if they were educated, if they were shown benevolence, they would eventually attribute their flourishing to Babylon and its gods, not the gods of their homeland. But if at any point they decided they didn't want that, do I need to do something with this? Um, yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah. Let's try that. If at any point we decided we didn't want that, they would be dealt with in the harshest way. Nebuchadnezzar was smart, but he was also reputedly quite ruthless as well. When the first attack happened, and some hostages were apparently taken even then, the prophet Jeremiah wrote a letter from the Lord to the soon-to-be exiles of Judah. And the letter goes like this. It's found in Jeremiah chapter 29. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all. To all those are carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Okay, I'll just pause there for a moment. How are we going with audio there? <laughs> yep. Do we need to swap this out? I'm happy to go handheld if we need to. That better? Okay, cool. <laughs> the Lord says, build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Look at all the active things there. God has carried you into exile, but you are, while you are there, you are to seek the peace of the city that you're in exile in. Important note. Pray to the Lord for it. Because if it prospers, you too will as well. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. In other words, don't tell people to conjure up stuff that you want to hear. They are prophesying lies to you in my name, and I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord and I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. And there is the weightiness of verse 11 in the middle of all that. <laughs> These early hostages are being prophetically told to brace themselves for what is essentially a lifetime of exile. And this will involve an interesting mindset. While you're in exile, build a house. Dig a garden. Get on with life. Marry. Build families. And seek the peace and prosperity of the place in which you somewhat unwillingly reside. Ever felt like that at times? 
It's almost like, oh, yeah, I, I remember, like, so we've just recently seen the passing of Tim Keller, and, and, and one of his best-known sentences towards the, the, the end there was, I just want to be with Jesus. And I can kind of hear that at times. We just want to get to the finish line. just want to be where Jesus is. Being in exile sometimes is just not so pleasant and not comfortable. And, and it's like, and it, we know it's not the end game and it's not the ideal place. It's, it's, not, it's not God's best. But we still have to be faithful in this and get to the point where Jesus is eventually. But sometimes we feel like we unwillingly reside. But do life where you live. Flourish where you're planted. As Peter describes us as exiles, this also serves as a great set of principles for the church even today. Our feature text explores the way one guy in particular, but three of his colleagues along the way, seek to live out these instructions given by Jeremiah. They are very young, they are impressionable. They show loads of promise in their own religion, but their potential to excel everywhere else but that religion is being noted by the world around them. There will be trials for these guys, but will they emerge in triumph? And will we engage with these guys and see ourselves in their journey? I pray that we can. The chapter opens like this. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord de delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles of the from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Now, there are competing ideas in these, few, you know, in these, you know, in these uh, first few lines here. But I want you to catch an overarching theological perspective that we would do well to remember. And it's simply this. Babylon believes they have defeated God. But we know that God always remains completely in control. We see here that Nebuchadnezzar is able to take items from the Jerusalem temple. And he, amongst all the spoils of taking what he wants for his palace, he's also able to take stuff from God's palace, as it were, and put him into the palace of his own deity. Just as he has booty and, 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 and war trophies and spoils of war, Apparently, so does his God too. So he takes all the articles from the Jerusalem temple and puts them in the temple of his own God, going, hey, you beat Yahweh. Good on you. That's the belief system in play here. It's war trophies dedicated to a God. But we know all around this from the proactive prophecies that, that Jeremiah and others have told that this was actually ordained by a God in control. The Lord delivered Israel to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar didn't just walk in and take them. God says, take what you want, but you'll soon see that I'm in control, not you. And time and again, we're going to see this idea play out throughout the book of Daniel as we study this. It goes on to say this, Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, note that for a moment, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. Now, Nebuchadnezzar is in a place where he believes he owns these people. And he wants the best of another nation to be his best instead. And the first thing he is looking for here is charisma. He wants the go-getter, the good-looking ones, 
the complete ones. Now that's important because some people, some translations refer to Ashman as being a head eunuch and there is this idea that, that the, uh, these men are somehow being emasculated or have become eunuchs themselves. But you can't be without defect and a eunuch at the same time. So these guys are complete in every way. It's probably a bit of a stretch to talk about the demasculation and that sort of stuff. That's probably just a stretch and maybe a bit of our conclusion bias. But Nebuchadnezzar is looking for people who will essentially make him look good. He's looking for for people that others will swoon over and they will swoon over him due to their association with him. They're making him look good. And the only way to attract charisma instead of character is to appeal to it, to flatter, to highlight the smarts and the strengths and the youthfulness and the outward appearance, to bring attention to these things, to build people's ego up. This was an early pitfall for even Israel as they sought their first and even their second king. The people swooned over Saul. He was head and shoulders above everybody else. And the prophet Samuel even swooned over David's brothers before God stepped in and said, hey, I'm looking for hearts, not faces here, guys. Go find David. If we let Babylon flatter us and appeal to our charisma without actually determining where our character is, and if we actually lean into our charisma instead of our character, we will find ourselves falling for the ways of the place in which we live, not the kingdom of God. Ashpenaz was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So as part of this ownership deal, Nebuchadnezzar seeks to further this sense of ownership with a three-year degree in culturalization. They are all going to learn the complete history of Babylon. And this is done in the hope that they would lean into adopting all of the folklore and the deities and the customs for themselves. Now, we need to remember that the Genesis account portrays all these Babylonian heroes as villains. Nimrod was a person uh, who who was an evil king of the region. He is also represented as an overarching presence that represents the bad of a rising uh, region. He's described in Genesis as a mighty, mighty warrior and a hunter, and you only became a mighty warrior by taking lives and winning the admiration of others for doing so. He's someone who exacerbates violence. The pagan folklore would increase his stature and appeal and and actually raise him up to not just be a king but a deity because that's what the pagans did. But anybody with a good grasp on God's law like these four men did would know that Nimrod and all these other heroes' mightiness would stand in contrast with the might of God, which is far greater. For three years, Babylon is telling these men all the fables of the past and the heroics and the virtues of these heroes. While at the same time, these young men will be groaning inside, having been told otherwise. But time spent in this location may lead to a bit of shift in their thinking. Their present location may cause them to wonder if the fables may even be true. In exile the stories of competing deities will sound more real than they really are. And they will seek to lead you astray because you're here in the here and now and this folklore is here and now and God is still afar off. You've got a generation to wait before you get there. That's what happens. That's where Daniel's at. 
You've got a lifetime to live before you get to where God is going to have you. And we are in the same way exiles and we have a lifetime to live before we get to where Jesus is. And in this temporal space, the allure of the present day heroes and, 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 and deities and the things that, that attract our, our, our passions now will get louder and louder and feel seemingly more real than they really are. They would, not, they would be called to learn two additional languages. They would be learning Aramaic, which was a local linguistic cousin to Hebrew. But because of where they were going to be working in the king's court, they would also learn a really difficult language called Akkadian. If you want to try to get a feel for that, our Korean folk, you have your na native language, the, the Sagor language, and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the languages that are local. But then to function in your neighborhood, you may have to learn something like either Thai or Burmese, right, to kind of get along with that, right? And they're sort of related languages. But then, how did you go going from that to English? It was a big jump, right? A big jump in language in, in learning what one of these is not like the other. It's the same sort of thing here. They were, you know, it, or if we're English speaking, it's like learning something like French or German because, you know, where thanks is Dunker. You know, oh, we can, we, we can transfer that, that's fine. But then over and above that, you also have to learn Latin. they would be forced to learn these languages in order to function in their world. Psalm 137 involves a line that says, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? And how can they sing it with two different languages swimming around in their minds? So to operate in Babylon, these men were called to speak in a very different way in order to function. Then the chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. Now the four original names in Hebrew have direct links to God and his nature. And the names given to them are actually in line with pagan Babylonian deities. This is another way of getting these guys to forget their roots and adopt the way of where they live now instead. And of course a new diet is put before them as well. All of these things can be summed up in one word. I've used it once already this morning and I've used it once in the, each in the last two weeks as well and it's the word assimilation. And to some degree, these young men have needed to use wisdom in where they would accept their fate and where they would gently challenge it. They've let the king tap into their charisma the outcome of that will appear in a moment. They've let the king put them through uni. They've learned the ways of the land and its languages. Why? Because God says you're going to be there for 70 years. It's all education for the context in which they now live. They've taken the name change because it by no means take away, takes away from their identity. They know who they are. You can change my name, but God knows where to find me and who I am. So in these things, Babylon might call them to live a certain way, to speak a certain way, and even be called a certain name. But it doesn't change their perspective of God. Because God remains Lord over it all. And because these young men know this, Nebuchadnezzar will soon as well. But interestingly, the food is the line they won't cross. Let's read on. Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. 
Now, God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of the Lord, the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. Oh, a lifetime of that. Wow. (laughs) This actually has nothing to do with ritual cleanness here. All right, there's been lots of comments maybe that this is something about all the food's not kosher, but even vegetables had had, uh, law around it if you're going to follow it absolutely. And also wine wasn't and actually you know, decide, wasn't delineated in the law either in how you would, you know, what was kosher and what was not. But this is more of a protest against the degree of fellowship with the pagan king. See, Babylon believes they are the ones who sustain you. We have all you need. Our ideals are the ones to live by. Eat our food. Be in close fellowship with us. Accept our hospitality as the act of a benevolent Lord. But they say, give us vegetables instead. (laughs) Because we know from the Apostle Paul this, 2 Corinthians, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? What fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. This was actually sharing a table in that space was an acceptance of, of that sort of fellowship. It was an acknowledgement that, that Babylon will sustain, that the king of Babylon, that Nebuchadnezzar is actually their sustainer. And he is actually going, as a, as a, as a pagan king, I am giving you my food. I'm giving you my sustenance. I'm giving you my hand of fellowship. And I, all my food is going to be dedicated to deities and all that sort of stuff. And we're going to you know, raise a glass to this one and that one. And we're going to you know, honor the gods as we go. But here you go. Here is your food. This is now your diet from now on. Eat it up. Accept fellowship with me. Eat at my table. But Paul says we are called to be in Babylon but separate at the same time. We are in the world. Jesus says we are in the world. We're not of it. We have a, there is a line where we have fellowship with the Father and we have fellowship with each other. And that is supposed to sustain us through the power of the Spirit more so than the things of the world that call us to fellowship instead. The word fellowship is a generous common partnership. And our generous common partnership is with our Lord. The answer of these young men is this, we won't accept your decadence and call it sustenance. We will accept nothing less than the power of God to sustain us. You may be our boss for the foreseeable future, but God is our true king. And we live in his provision, first and foremost. Or in the words of Jesus, quoting Deuteronomy, man doesn't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. He is our sustainer. Note here also, though, they used gentleness and respect in their stand here. If all they had was charisma, then you would expect these guys to be absolute divas about it all. But they they quietly leverage the favor they have with their mentor through God. They ask for a short trial 
one that will be remedied quickly if it didn't work. But that's all they need because it's enough to show that it does work. And they appear, they actually seem to be submitted to the court official here. If it didn't work, if God says, yeah, that's not the way it's going to be, just eat the food, they would have towed the line. But God's sustenance shines through when they take their gentle stand. The chapter closes out this way. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Now, I'm sure Nebuchadnezzar would be taking credit for all that. In his mind, the assimilation worked. The uni degree is the best one out there. The system he's got, the context that he's set up, the deities that he's promoted, the folklore of his homeland, it's all there and it all works. Here is proof. I made these guys. But again, we're told that God blesses these people with the skills to operate well in the king's court. In fact, because they lent on character, not charisma, their wisdom and insight and perhaps even their work ethic in applying their learning would all be on display. For a time, Nebuchadnezzar would think it's all his doing, but he'll soon learn that these men are here in God's timing and for God's purposes. And some of those purposes will even benefit the pagan king. And as a result, we will have this conclusion. Babylon believes they made you. But friend, you are the direct result of God blessing You are here because God, we we are exiles in this world, but we are here to extend blessing to that exilic place. Blessed to be a blessing, even in the Babylonian setting. We're at the very beginning of this series, and we're going to go into chapter 2 next week and and go deeper into this. We had a great preaching team meeting when we were all planning out this series, and I know our our speakers are all keyed up and ready to go. There's a lot of excitement about what is to come in this series, and I'm looking forward to what they all bring. As we come to an end on this particular one, let me offer you three final thoughts. First, do not settle for an assimilated life. Instead, actively anticipate what is still to come. All right, this is actually, again, tapping into what I've already said. Anticipate, don't assimilate. All right, to assimilate is to accept the present as absolute reality and it comes at the expense of what is to come. You can't serve two masters. You can either serve the, 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 the powers of this time or we can serve who is going to reign in eternity. And we make that choice by how we live and, and what we anticipate. We can soak up all this education of the world and this culturalization and all these things and make it our own and adopt it and end up falling for its ways instead of using these things as simply tools to actually get by in this time that we live. But we are citizens of a greater kingdom. The kingdom of God is already among you, as Jesus said, and it is still to come. We have a citizenship that far far exceeds anything that this world can offer us. Anticipate the kingdom. And as you anticipate the kingdom, we anticipate all that will be there We seek to actually demonstrate those things now. When Jeremiah writes, seek the peace of the city to which I'm sending you, that is an anticipation of God's character in full full flight. 
as we seek the shalom of this city, we are anticipating the shalom that is still to come. As we seek the well-being of people here, we are seeking, we are living in an anticipation of the well-being that we will all experience in the kingdom. Let us anticipate what the kingdom of God is like in the way we live now. So the people who are part of this kingdom here look at us and go, I like your king. Can I get in on this as well? My second thought is this. If the wise in exile dare to stand apart, the Lord will cause them to stand out. We are all exiles, according to Peter. Stand apart as exiles. And the Lord will cause us in his time and in his way and in his, his purposes, cause us to stand out for his glory. And here's a bit of an interesting one as I finish up here. If the older demonstrate a valid grasp on how to live in Babylon, the faith of the younger will thrive there too. All right, we just learned about four young men in their teens who are working out how to um, understand the context they're in and how to actually live for God in that. And I dare say it's because where they were, they were offered a chance to learn the ways of God well and to see God in the exile space. There have been studies done and surveys taken of, of young adults who have left country towns and other stuff and gone to the big cities and gone to university and stuff like that and, and, and they either make it or they don't in their faith. Christian kids and some, the ones who either walk away or don't, they're surveyed. What is it about your faith that changed when you left where you lived and ended up here? What changed or what didn't? And almost every time, the answer was, my parents showed me how to live in the world effectively. Or, my parents lived out of faith that just didn't make sense in the world I live in. And that was directly related to the faith steps they took. We need to understand as older folk to, uh, to and I say we, I'm not far off 50 now, we, we need to understand that this world out there is complex and crazy and, 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 and all sorts of craziness is going on that even we didn't ex experience 20, 30 years ago. But we need to show the world, show our young, next generation that the world might be Babylonian in, in its way, but the kingdom of God works out there. Let me demonstrate to you how that is. And that means not withdrawing, or that doesn't mean living in a, in a cocoon somewhere. It actually means you being engaged with what is going on in the outside world. Knowing what TikTok is, if you have to. Uh, knowing what is going on out there, what are the mindsets, and don't just write it off as, oh, that's just woke idealism. and yeah, yeah, yeah. Engage with it. Engage with the things that are feeding your kids doubts. If you won't deal with doubt now, you'll be dealing with deconstruction later. Learning how to, to present a viable, faithful God in all that we do in our lives and showing our kids what that looks like. Being faithful with who we are in Jesus for the next generation. If they see a viable faith in us, knowing that we've got tenure in this thing, and if they see that our faith makes sense for them and their world, and we understand it well enough to show them how to do that, the next generation will be safe as a result. But if we just kind of shake it off or just, you know, not engage with that or keep it at surface level or just, you know, just teach a very, you know, just follow Jesus, don't go to hell, but teach them, without teaching them how to engage with the world now, we can lose our kids. But these young men clearly had a good foundation. If the older demonstrate a valid grasp on how to live in Babylon, the next generation will do so too. So there are my three thoughts that I want to leave with you at this particular time. I'm going to stop there. It's almost lunchtime.
please remain back. Let's enjoy some fellowship together. Let's enjoy who we are in Christ together. So as we sit and as we share a sacred table of a meal together today, let us be, let's enjoy that for what it is, knowing that this is far different to the king's tables out there. We're just starting with a series, there's more to say, but let's stop there and pray.